Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to this um, presentation of the Council on Aging seminars that I do here at the Hudson Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who don't meet, know me. I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. There are 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. They all do other stuff. I do elder law. Um, many of the presentations that I do here are more kind of general interest presentations. Um, this is a more specific topic, although it's a specific topic that a lot of people are interested in. That's probably why so many of you are here. Um, so we're going to talk about what happens if my good friends Frank and Mary haven't done beans. So you remember Frank and Mary, their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and their, their goal, live in the house, which they're living in the house, until they die and be buried in the backyard, and everything's been working out great. They still got their house. He's got a Zyra, they've got an annuity, they've got bank accounts. They got $625,000. Everything is great. Mary needs nursing home care. As you've all learned in the past, we're going to shift everything to Frank. And then Frank's going to keep about $100,000, take the rest of it, and buy an annuity. And then we're going to be able to qualify Mary right away for master. The question, though, which often comes up, is if Mary is going into the nursing home, uh, and so that's what we would do. The question, though, is and then, as I've always talked to you folks about it, um, once Mary was in the nursing home, um, we would have Frank change his will so that if he died, all those assets that are now in his name, instead of going to Mary, would instead go in trust for Mary's benefit. As long as he does it that way, then when he dies, all the assets that he owns are going to remain safe, even though Mary's still in the nursing home, right? But what about if Frank died before and they didn't do any of this stuff? You know anybody that's like this? They put it off. They didn't do anything. I every week get somebody who comes in and says they really want to deal with, with protecting their assets because their spouse just died. I'm like, you know, it's a little late now. It's harder to do it, right? You have to transfer things out of your name. You have to wait five years, right? And the, and the, and the transfer, really, you have to lose control over a lot of stuff. So let's assume, though, that Mary didn't do any of that. Let's assume the true worst case, which also is irregular, right? That some people didn't do anything. And so there's Mary. She's got all these assets, which she inherited from Frank. $300,000 worth of house and $325,000 worth of other. She's got her social security check is now what Frank's used to be, $2,000 a month. So now she's going to the nursing home. And Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. come in and say, so we've just got to spend down all of our assets, right? Until we have nothing, we'll spend down all the cash until we have less than $2,000 in countable assets. And then she'll, Mary will qualify for Mass Health, so Mass, Mass Health will put a lien on the house, right? Is that the only option? And the answer to that is no, that's not the only option. Your options are more limited in that situation, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, but you can, all, Mary can always qualify for Mass Health. The takeaway from this is Mary can always qualify for Mass Health the question is, do you want her to qualify? Because in this situation, there are these balance, there's a kind of a balance of interest that you want to kind of figure out. So that's what the heart of this presentation is going to be about. Now, this presentation's got a lot of math in it, and I'm sorry, there's just no way around it. Um, you, you, it's all this is this presentation is all about the math. So your big takeaway is, I want you to kind of understand the way in which the things I'm going to talk about work and figure. Whatever your case is, you got to do the math. But don't count on doing the math yourself. Have somebody help you with doing the math so you can kind of figure out basically what your strategy should be. So, once again, Peter, Paul, and Mary's question now regarding their mother is now what? Ma's in the nursing home. She's got all those assets. She's going to be staying in the nursing home for a while. You don't know how long she's going to live. Could be six months, could be five years, you don't know. The average stay in a nursing home is less than two years. We've all known people, though, that have stayed significantly longer than that. So a part of the thinking that you have to do when you're in this situation, you have to take a guess. You have to take a guess. How long is the person who is in the nursing home going to be there? But that said, you need to keep this in mind. Um, try to pay at a good nursing home, even at kind of some pretty mediocre nursing homes right now. I have this one in the area that I won't mention. Uh, there's like a, got one star on the on the Center for Medicaid or the CMS, the Center, the, uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services National Survey, and it's over twelve thousand dollars a month, right? 
So, this, and, and, and so a typical nursing home, we're going to assume for purposes of today that if you're on private pay at a nursing home, you're paying $12,000 a month, right? What you need to understand, though, about the way Mass Health works is that if you qualify for Mass Health, then Mass, then, then a different rate gets applied to that very same bed in that very same nursing home. And typically, while that rate is going to vary from case to case, because Mass, Mass Health has negotiated separate rates with every single nursing home, and they they will offer rates to that nursing home in ten different categories based on the estimated number of nurse minutes per day. What a great bureaucratic notion, right? The estimated number of nurse minutes per day that have to be spent on that person. And then that rate gets reevaluated every six months because it's assumed that people's condition will change about every six months. Um, but on average, having said that, the difference between your payment on when you're in category one, which is the lowest rate of service, lowest rate of nurse minutes per day, and category 10, the highest rate, is not that big. And the average is going to be about $7,000 a month. So the same bed that you're paying $12,000 a month for on private pay, once Mary is on Mass Health, that bed is going to be getting, that nursing home is getting $7,000 a month. The difference is $5,000 per month, right? Now Mass Health is not going to be paying all of that set. They're going to require that Mary throw in all of her income, that's another one of the Mass Health rules. Once you're on Mass Health, your income from Social Security and pension goes to the nursing home, minus a very small amount, $72 and some change, that Mary gets to keep to wash her hair once a month, you know, and do her nails. That's it, $72 and some change. All the rest goes to the nursing home. Mass Health pays the difference between that and whatever the Mass Health rate is. So we're going to assume in this case that Mary's paying in her $2,000 a month now if she were on Mass Health, and Mass Health is paying the rest, which is also $5,000 per month. So the worst case, in the worst case, when you're, when you're thinking about what ha is happening to Mary's assets and the diminishing of Mary's assets, you want to calculate the burn rate. What is the amount of savings that, it, that Mary needs in order to be at the nursing home every, every month? And that's the, the, obviously that amount is the nursing home cost minus her income. And her income, we're going to assume, is all $2,000 a month, okay? So the burn rate in this case, if she's on private pay, is 12, is 12,000 minus 2,000, or $10,000 a month. And remember that she has assets uh, that are worth $625,000, right? So if she sold her house, converted that to cash, had a big pile of money, and just stayed on private pay, because she said, as some of my clients Boy, it's seldom now. It used to be a lot more would say, I just feel morally responsible. I don't think I should be living off the state. And I tell you, and I go back to these clients, I say, but you are the state. You paid tax money into the state for years and years. You know, you paid all this money. And 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 the, the social contract is you pay your taxes and you get your benefits. And that's the deal. You know, but people never people you used to kind of reject that. That is kind of gone now, right? Um, so anyway, all of their, her money will be exhausted in 62.5 months. That's a burn rate of $10,000 a month uh, divided into $625,000, 62.5 months. So all the money will be gone in five years, right? Five years is 60 months. So, and, so the, and, and, and once again, you, 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 would, you would spend down all of the money until the assets are exhausted. Here it was just the cash assets, but I'm assuming that you would sold the house. If you just sold the cash assets, Right, the 300, or if you just used the cash assets and kept the house, then your money would be exhausted in 32.5 months. Then she'd be, then Mary would be on mass health, and then they'd impose the lien on the house to get reimbursed after Mary had died. Okay. Um, now, the question is, so that's that's a piece of this. Remember that concept, the burn rate. Okay. The next piece is mass health eligibility. How do you get qualified? Well, you're qualified for mass health as soon as you have you can own a home. As long as the home has an equity of less than eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, you can have other assets, but not very much. Only two thousand dollars in countable assets. Ca countable means cash or money that can be turned into cash. When I say cash, I mean money in a bank. Okay. Um, it, 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 and the amount that is going to get paid to the nursing home is going to be all the income minus seventy-two dollars and eighty cents. Um, Mass Health is going to pay the rest. And then to the extent that you own any assets in, at death, like the house in this case, 
Mass Health will have a lien on that asset to get repaid following your death. So that's how you get eligible for Mass Health, and that's what happens after you qualify. So the question for Mary is whether there is a way that she could take the cost of her nursing home care and move it from $12,000 a month, which is the private pay rate, to $7,000 a month, which is the rate once she's on Mass Health. Because if she can do that, right, then, then if, if she were able to restructure her assets so that she were immediately on Mass Health, the burn rate for her would have gone down by $5,000 per month, right? The difference between burning at $10,000 per month because the cost is 12 and, and, and her income is two and she's gonna burn 10. And, the, and, and spending at the mass health rate, which is $7,000 per month. The cost of mass health is seven, her income is two, the burn rate is five. If you can figure out a way to do that, there are three ways to do that. Mary can buy an annuity. Mary can lend all the money to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And Mary can put the money in a D4C pooled trust. Now, we I mentioned these terms in other cases, in other matters, but in this case, I'm specifically talking about this situation because we often talk about annuities. Remember, when, remember that's what Frank was going to do. If Frank and Mary were both alive, we we're going to shift everything to Frank. Frank was going to buy the, an annuity. This is the same kind of annuity, but I'm going to talk to you about that. So, the annuity. In order for Mary to convert her countable assets to a non-countable <coughs> to an income stream, and therefore make herself eligible for mass health, she has to buy an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is not longer than her actuarial life expectancy. Now, Mass Health, once she's done that, the day after she's done that, all of the, of the money that was in that pile that's called assets is no longer there. And all she has is an income stream. Now, the income, the monthly payments from that annuity, are going to get, have to get added to her other income and get paid to the nursing home, right? And then Mass Health is going to pay the difference between all of that income and the Mass Health rate. Right? And whatever that leftover amount is that Mass Health is paying, Mass Health is going to have a lien. In this case, if Mary used all of her cash, the 325, to buy the annuity, Mass Health would have a lien on the house. So Mass Health will get reimbursed following Mary's death. But that, and, 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 that, and I just said a lot of math. But remember in, the, in your mind, keep thinking, what you just did was you caused the cost of that room to drop from $12,000 a month to $7,000 a month. And so the rate at which these payments are being made, whether because the annuity payment is paying or because there's a lien for some leftover amount because Mass Health is paying the difference, is at that lower rate. And so the result of doing all these things is you're, you're, you're reducing this burn rate and therefore really increasing the amount of time that it takes to burn away all the money and increasing the likelihood that if Mary dies, during that period that the money's being burned away, there's still gonna be some money left. Okay, so that's kind of the concept. So, go back to Mary. There's her house, those are her assets. She's got $625,000, counting 325 in cash or cash equivalent assets. So, pretend that Mary takes all of her money, all $325,000, and buys an annuity. Um, if Mary were 80 years old, her life expectancy would be nine years. Where does that come from? And once again, every once in a while, people say, that's impossible. Life expectancy is like 70 years. Well, if you were born this year, a woman, uh, if you were married, born this year, your life expectancy would be around 74, 75 years. If you were 100 right now, your life expectancy would be 2.5 years. Just by virtue of the fact that you're still standing. Those are, and if you wanted to find that, by the way, if you ever want to know what your life expectancy is, email me and I'll send it to you. There's an there's a actuarial table, of course the IRS has always figured this out, and MassHealth uses the IRS table to figure all this stuff out. So, if Mary took that, that amount of money that she has, $325,000, and she, and she bought a nine-year annuity, and I'm, gonna, I'm rounding in this case, right? If she bought a nine-year annuity, <coughs> roughly, if you were to divide $325,000 by 108 payments, you'd get about $3,000 per month. So if she went and bought that annuity, she'd have new income for the next nine years of $3,000 per month. Right? So now her income would have just gone from $2,000 a month to $5,000 a month. But by, but by <coughs> buying that annuity, 
she will make herself eligible for mass health, right? Because once she's bought the annuity, her cash or cash equivalent assets have gone to zero. So they've gone below $2,000. She can still own the house and qualify for mass health. So she'll qualify for mass health by buying that annuity. Now remember, the mass health rate is $7,000. The mass health, the burn rate is the mass health rate minus her income and, 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 the, and this, the lien amount. So the, the, what she's going to be, what she was, if, she, if mass health is $7,000 a month, her income is now her old social security check of $2,000 a month plus the $3,000 annuity payment. So her income is now $5,000 a month. Seven minus five is two, right? Um, these, these, and, 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 and mass health will be paying the difference, the difference between her income and the mass health rate, right? If you, if you took, use those numbers, right, and used as a result this different burn rate, you would find that as a result, her money, instead of being exhausted after five years, gets exhausted after 10 years, 10 years. So her kids are gonna have vastly increased the likelihood that following her death, there's still gonna be money that are, that's going to the kids. And of course, that was Mary's objective, right? She wanted to leave everything to her husband, but he's dead. She wanted to leave everything else to the kids. Nowhere in her will did she say, I really want to leave some to the nursing home. Oh, I really, really want to leave some to the nursing home. So, you're, so this isn't like some magic trick. That the, it's like not a scam from the kids. It's doing exactly what Mary had always wanted to do. It's getting extra money to the kids. So you can use this um, as a mechanism, and you can take all the money and put it into the promissory right note, or excuse me, into the annuity. A second alternative this is one that we don't recommend to people because I keep thinking that mass health is going to change their mind. You can also, basically, instead of giving the money to the to an insurance company and having them agree to pay you back monthly with interest, which is really what an annuity is, it's a promise to pay you back your money, together with interest, which is typically very low. Instead, you can give it all to your kids. You give all your money to your kids and have them agree to give you back the money together with interest. Now, they have to sign a promissory note for that. A promissory note is a promise to pay back all the money. The promissory note has to have the very same characteristics as the annuity. It has to call for equal monthly payments over a term that does not, ex not exceed the actuarial life expectancy of the person to, who, is, who is borrowing the money. It has to do all of the same things. But right now, MassHealth's position is that if you lend your kids $325,000 and they simply give you back this piece of paper, this promise that they're gonna pay, that's a legitimate thing, right? And a legitimate spend down and you can then qualify for mass health. Now, in some other states, that's not legitimate. They consider that to be a gift because this is an unsecured loan. They just don't think the money's gonna come back. And so others, in other states, attorneys have started dealing with that by adding adding security to these loans, saying, for example, that the loan can't be just, isn't just going to go to the kids, it's going to go to a trust for the benefit of the kids. You name one of the kids as the trustee of the trust. You, you say right in the promissory note that all of the money that is in the trust is going to stay there. It's not going to get distributed as security for the repayment of the promissory note. It goes on and on. I'm just saying this device is available. The time that we use it the most is for people who are over 90 years old. And the reason for that is if when you're 89 and a woman or 88 and a man, your life expectancy dips below five years. And, and whereas in the old days, when I say the old days, you know, I know you think old days could be a long time, right? But a couple year, at, until a couple of years ago, there were still annuity companies or insurance companies that were writing annuities for as short as a year. <laughs> So the, the annuity mechanism was always available. Um, recently, because the market has been so terrible and the interest rates have been so terrible, these companies have found they can't make any money by writing those annuities anymore. And so they stopped. They said, we will not, so the typical insurance company now, no, pretty much all insurance companies now will not write an annuity having a term of shorter than five years. So if you are older and need to do this, then you need to take this chance and do the, the loan to the kids with the, the promise of repayment. We're doing this right now with a family. Um, they have a million dollars. We're doing a million dollar loan with the promise of repayment. So tune in. Uh, I'll know in about six months whether MassHealth groaned about this and rejected it. I think, you know, under current rules, 
it's still going to be okay. So there's, there's that other possibility. But both of those are really the same mechanism. Then there's possibility number three. Uh, you can put the money into a D4C pool of trust. We have talked about these a few times in the past, but I'm going to kind of refresh everybody's memory because this is pretty technical too. First of all, why is it called a D4C pool of trust? Um, the answer is there is a, it's part of the Medicaid law, is a section in the law that basically sets out the rules for, for what happens when there's someone that's on mass health or, or, or applying for mass health and, they, and there is a trust for their benefit and somebody else is the trustee. And the rule is, because this happens a lot of course, you know, since Medicaid has been created in the 1960s, all of this stuff has kept evolving, so this has showed up a lot. So this section of the federal law says that if there is such a trust, the trustee is, and the trustee has any discretion to distribute any money to the older person who is the beneficiary. No matter what the trust says, the trustee is required to use their maximum discretion under the trust to make those distributions to the beneficiary or to pay the nursing home if she's in a nursing home, right? Because the presumption is that, that you know, if the money is there, we sh we, you know, the goal of Medicaid is not to take care of the middle class. The goal of the Medicaid is supposed to be to take care of poor people, right? And Medicaid, and the only reason why the middle class is doing all of this is because, as you all know, Medicare does not cover Alzheimer's disease. It basically doesn't cover it. There was a New York Times article this week talking about the kind of hidden costs of, of, of Alzheimer's and the fact that people are all getting impoverished as a result of, all, of, all, of Alzheimer's. And the reason is because they've got things, things that are medical but aren't called skilled and therefore Medicare won't pay for it because Medicare only pays for skilled care. You know, the cost of helping somebody put on their shirt, the cost of making sure that somebody's with a person who has dementia because otherwise they could drift away. So anyway, Medi the, Medicare, the Medicaid rule is that if there's a trust, the trustee has to use this discretion. Um, but, there, but there is one exception to that. And that, well, like there are a couple, but only one that's relevant here. And, and it's in a, a section of the federal law, uh, which is called 40, 42 U.S.C. 1396P. I think it's 1A T4C. So it's this long section deals with trust. That's 1442 U.S.C. 1396P. And this is the section that, that deals with the exception, which says if you are taking your money and putting it into a pooled trust, then the usual trust rules don't apply. The trustee in that case can actually use the money, for the, have the right to use the money for the benefit of the old person. But the money doesn't get counted for mass health purposes, and the trustee doesn't have to pay the nursing home. If you want to learn more about pool trust, Google pool trusts, uh, or uh, look at any of these websites of the pool trusts that are that are in operation in Massachusetts. There are some rules regarding pool trusts. They have to be operated by a nonprofit that is operating for the benefit of older or disabled and or disabled people. They have to be entering into contracts with you through which you are giving them money which they are pooling with everybody else's money they've been given, hence the name pool trust. They're investing and reinvesting that money. But then that pool, the trustee of that pool trust has the right to distribute whatever amounts are in there for the benefit of the person who is in the nursing home but doesn't have to pay the nursing home. And the assets that you shift into the pool trust do not count as assets of the person who is applying for mass health and there's no look back. Just like the purchase of the annuity. You buy the annuity on day one, on day two, you can qualify for mass health. You transfer the money into the pool trust on day one, on day two, you can qualify for mass health. So what can the deep what can this pool trust pay for? Right? Well, it can pay for anything that benefits the beneficiary. So I'm gonna give you my the, the, the two examples that one example that I've always given was the wheelchair. You've heard this example, some of you, right? It's funny because I've been doing this for like seven years. So I look around and I say, wow, I know a lot of the people in this room. This is, you know, it's like old times. Like. So one of the, the, the worst part about, how many people here have been to a nursing home? Raise your hand. Oh, about half. So the worst part about going to a nursing home for me, and I go to nursing homes a lot, like typically about once a week, I'm going to one of the nursing homes is you go in and, you're, and there's this corridor, you know, you're going down this corridor of rooms and people are in the corridor and they're sitting in these wheelchairs and they're like this, right? They're trying to sleep or they're sleeping, but they're all like scrunched down. Now, the reason why that's happening 
is because of the wheelchair, right? They are sitting in a wheelchair that was not designed to be slept in. It was designed to transport somebody from room one to room two. So it has these aluminum, you know, uh, um, rest, hand rests, and it has like a, a, a cloth back, you know, or a plastic back. You've seen that wheelchair. That wheelchair costs less than $1,000, and it's the nursing home's wheelchair, right? Now, for $10,000, you can buy a wheelchair, it reclines, it's got all kinds of padding, because it's designed to be slept in or, or to be in for a long period. You can get them with a cup holder, little TV set, you can get it with headphones, you can get them motorized, right? Um, that's going to cost you, though. And Mass Health isn't going to pay for that wheelchair, right? But the D4C could. So if you have a relative who, is, who you know because of their dementia or because of physical illness, is going to be they're spending their last years in the nursing home. Well, you know, you're not going to be able to like make their day by saying, oh, you're cured. But at least you can say, well, we're going to use some of your money that you saved all your life so you could live a good life and make being in the nursing home as good as it could be. You know, it's as good as it can be. God decides the number of days, we decide how to spend them. You know, I mean, you, nobody decided to go to that nursing home, right? And your job, if you're the caregiver, is to try to make it as good as it can be, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is better furniture. Now, in, what I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, the obvious one is the flat screen TV. So I was just in a nursing home two weeks ago, and I went in to, to talk to the little lady and have her do, sign some stuff and stuff. Because she's got some physical problems, but she's okay. And, but next to her is a person who, who is watching TV, right? Because it's, these are all doubles, right? If you're in a mass health room, if you're in just about any room in a nursing home, it's a double. So, so here's the person watching TV, very loud. It's up loud because the lady has trouble hearing in Spanish, right? So my client is like, whoa, you know, imagine living with that for 18 hours a day, right? The, t the, the TV next door. So, with the, from the D4C, you could buy a flat screen TV. You can buy headphones or earbuds. You know, you used to, I used to say you could buy all these great movies, but now you can just buy Netflix, you know, and you can have infinite, you can watch anything you want ever, over and over again, especially if you got dementia. You know, you may want to see The Sound of Music a thousand times. That's okay. Just keep watching. Just keep watching. Look at it again. How much, you like? How much a month? Basically nothing, right? So, so you can do that. You can buy better furniture because the standard nursing home bed is a standard nursing home bed, and it's institutional, you know, and it's not so great. But you know, you could buy a better bed. The standard institutional chair, you know, every room has two beds and two chairs, and they're the standard from a Naga Hyde chair. You could buy a great chair. You know, you can you can buy better food, and this is where I always do my food story. So, um, actually, it was here that I met a lady after a presentation. And I was talking about D4Cs. This was several years ago. And she said, Mr. Bergeron, she said, you know, I'm sorry I didn't kind of know about this before. My mother had like a quarter of a million dollars, but she's only got $60,000 left. And so I, this wouldn't really be useful, right? Because we're just, she, and she was paying on private pay for the nursing home. That's how she made it from 250 down to 60. And I said, well, you know, I said, in the nursing home world, $60,000 isn't very much money. It's about five months in the nursing home. But in the real world, 60000 is a lot of money, right? So I said, if you put the money in the D4C, you immediately qualify your mother for mass health, right? I said, you know, certainly following her death, there's not going to be anything left in there because mass health is going to have a lien. Mass health has a lien on this money, just like they have on the, on the, on the um, annuities, right? To get repaid. But in the meantime, in the meantime, if your mother wants anything, you, can, you get a bunch of money. You get $60,000, right? So she did it. She, you know, she, she put the money into the D4C and immediately qualified her mother for mass health. And the folks from the D4C sent out one of their social workers to sit with her and say, well, we just want to talk about the care plan for your mother. We want to know how we can use this money for your mother's benefit, right? So what do you think? I mean, does your mother like any particular movies? We can get her a flat screen TV. You know, we can get her a, just what I just said, right? So, oh, no, actually my mother, the mother was 94 at this point. So, no, my mother's really blind. I mean, she really, that isn't going to help. Okay. Well, are there, is there great music that she likes to listen to? You know, we could buy her, a, you know, a great, once again, set of headphones. We can buy her a great a TV or a CD player or whatever, right? Whatever music she wants. Whatever music she wants, she can have. Well, you know, she's really deaf also, right? 
right? So the, that's not that easy. Well, are there any foods that she likes? Are there any special foods? And the woman kind of stepped back. She said, oh, you know, we grew up, we didn't have a lot of money. You know, my, my parents grew up and there were several kids. Um, but the big treat in the house was a couple times a year we would go out to eat and we'd go and get lobster. My mother loved lobster. And this lady just looked at her and said, well, your mother can have lobster whenever she wants, right? So I, so I talked to the lady. Her mother died about two years later, right? Um, and she told me, she said, the mother had lobster at least once a week for the entire last two years of her, you know? <laughs> and so I say to you, is that such a bad thing, you know? I mean, it was the mother's money. The fact that the mother didn't use all of her money to pay the nursing home, to be on Mass Health, to end up having to live on $72.80 a month, right? So that's what the deed would, it can also, by the way, pay for trips. If, if the person is, is physically able to get out, uh, it'll pay for a trip wherever you want to go. You go to the Cape, right? You can go to Florida. It'll pay for the person to accompany that person on the trip, right? And, and it will pay for home maintenance. Remember, in the cases that I've given you, as we've discussed, once Mary is on Mass Health, um, all of her income has to go to the nursing home, right? Even though she still has her house, which she has said she, that she's saying she's going to return to her house, and therefore Mass Health has said, okay, we'll just put a lien on that. But then the question is, how do you pay the taxes or the insurance or the heat bill or any of that stuff? There's no money because all the money is going to the nursing home. Well, the D4C can pay for all that, right? It can maintain the house. So that after Mary dies, to the extent that there is extra value in the house, you know, there's still going to be value in the house. It's not going to have deteriorated. So it can do a lot of things. So why wouldn't you, in that case, simply, if you're Mary, forget about the annuity and that other stuff. Just put all the money in the D4C, right? Because by putting the money in the D4C, as soon as you put it in and gotten those assets below $2,000, Mary has qualified for Mass Health. Right? And all of the other things that we've talked about apply. Right? So the reason is because um, when Mary dies, the D4C will have a right to a percentage of the remaining money that is in the D4C. And, and while, the, while the percentage varies depending on the D4C that you make your contract with, there are five of them as I mentioned, right? Um, that could be as high as 20% of the money. Right? So if Mary puts all of her money into the D4, and, and, and th so the way it works is, after Mary dies, the D4C keeps her percentage. Mass Health has a lien on the rest to get repaid. This is the very same thing as with the annuity, right? And with the house. Uh, and then whatever's left over, the kids will get, right? So in this case, you're, you're taking this extra 20% hit. The result of that would be if, um, um, if you were taking all $325,000, right? And you were and you were putting all of that into the annuity, and there and you didn't use any of it, so that there was still 325 at the end, and the D4C were keeping 20 percent, right? Well, then the remaining money in the D4C would be only 260 thousand dollars instead of 325 thousand dollars, and and that and, and remember, Mass Health will have a lien on that money to make sure that ultimately, so that still ultimately, as far as the nursing home is concerned. You have the same burn rate, $5,000 per month, right? But in addition, you've had to pay this. So in some cases, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this if, uh, if um, you think Mary's only got a few months to live, right? Because, in, or six, maybe, you know, or you, and you think that you're not going to be using any of this money because then that's a big hit to take. So the question then is, how do you combine those two things? There's kind of the annuity path, which gets Mary qualified. There's the D4C path, which gets her qualified. Or maybe there's some kind of combination. Maybe there's some kind of combination. Maybe what Mary can do, I'm gonna step back just for a second. So the, in, in some ways, when you're thinking about buying these annuities, the perfect annuity is the one that pays Mary just enough money that together with her social security check, it covers the nursing home bill at the Mass Health rate, right? Because if it does that, then Mass Health actually isn't getting, isn't accum accumulating any lien because Mass Health isn't paying the nursing home anything, right? You're basically paying, or Mary is paying the nursing home the seven thousand dollars instead of the twelve thousand dollars because she's on Mass Health, right? So suppose that you did that. Suppose that you said, okay. The burn rate, as we've discussed, as far as Mary is concerned, is about $5,000 per month. 
right? We figured that out because if, if Mary's, if the mass health rate is $7,000 a month on the nursing home, and she's got income of $2,000, the amount that has to come from savings somehow is going to be the extra $5,000. So suppose you bought a $5,000 annuity, right? And suppose you bought it for four years. I'm just, I just picked four years because it made the math work, right? If you bought a 5,000, if you were buying an annuity that would pay about $5,000 a month for four years, that's going to cost you about $240,000. This assumes that the annuity is paying crummy interest, but they do. They pay crummy interest. So that's not a bad <laughs> assumption. So remember, Mary had $325,000 total. She had the house and she had three twenty-five. dollars So if she buys that annuity for two forty, dollars she's still got $85,000 left, right, out of her three twenty-five. dollars if she puts that money into the D4C, $85,000, unless Mary's going to live for a long time, $85,000 is probably going to be plenty to take care of all of Mary's needs while she's alive in the nursing home, right? So if you put, you put um, the, the, the $85,000 in the D4C, suppose that over those four years, suppose Mary lives the four years, and over those four years, um, you, the D4C uses all that money for Mary's benefit. At the end, that means that there isn't going to be any 20% that gets paid to the D4C because there's nothing left in the D4C. Suppose, on the other hand, that they don't use any of the money. Suppose that when Mary dies, all $85,000 is still there, right? Well, in that case, the 20% penalty is only $17,000 as opposed to the much larger penalty if all $325,000 had been there. So it may be that there's this combination, this blending of the annuity and the D4C that is the right way to go. How do you think about what to do, which ones of those to do? Well, you might you would consider things like Mary's life expectancy. You know, if you think that Mary's going to live for a very short time, um, then to have to put a big chunk of money into the D4C only to end up having to pay them 10 or 20 percent of that because Mary died six months later. That might not have been the best idea versus parking all the money on the, in the annuity. On the other hand, it, you, you don't want to buy an annuity that's going to generate more income than the amount that it's going to cost you to be in the nursing home because then that causes all kinds of other problems. So you, it's kind of like a balance. Also, it's going to be a function of how much her assets are and her income. For example, say that's Mary's situation. Say she's got her house, but then instead of having $325,000 in assets, she's only got $75,000 in assets. And say her income is still the 2000 and say she's still in pretty good shape, and you're thinking she's going to be living in the nursing home for a while, right? So that no matter what you do, at the end of the day, there's going to be no money left because mass health is going to be owed more than what you got left, right? So in that case, you do like the lady that I was talking to you about before. You park the money in the D4C. You don't care how much money. You try to spend as much money as you can on Mary. You get her as good as you can be because you know you're not going to see the money anyway. So either it's going to go on to her while she's still living for her benefit, or it's going to go to mass health. You, got to, you can choose, right? On the other hand, um, and we already talked about what, the, what that could buy. On the other hand, I often will talk to people who will say, who've got substantial assets, and who will say, you know, rather than do this, I'm simply going to make it past the look back period. So we're going to spend a few minutes now talking the look back period. And by the way, few people are being really quiet, and I can tell because I've done a lot of math. And I'm, as I said when I started, there's kind of no way around this. But you want to, as I'm going through this, you want to keep stepping back and saying, you, you get it basically, right? That no matter what, you always want to figure this out to see whether it's worthwhile for Mary to qualify for mass health. Because the only alternative for Mary, in her case, is to do this. Everybody knows what the five-year look-back period is. You've all heard of it, right? And you all assume that that was your only option. So often I talk to people, even though they're married, who think that they can't do anything now because one of the spouses is going to the nursing home, and it's too late because they can't give things away and wait five years because they don't know they can give it to each other and not wait at all. So if you are making a gift, when, when, if Mary is trying to qualify for mass health, she has to show that she has less than $2,000. She also has to show that if she did not self-impoverish, that she did not give things away, and a gift is simply a transfer for less than fair market value. When somebody says, oh, I'll just sell my house to my kids for a dollar. No, 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 that's not a sale, that's a gift, right? A gift is a transfer for less than fair market value. 
and the amount of the gift is the difference between what you get and what the fair market value is. And the rule is, if you're applying for Mass Health, you have to report, and you, it's basically they can they can require that you give them bank statements and income tax returns and everything for the previous five years, so that they can basically do an examination of all those records to see if there are any transfers that they think are suspicious, and ask you to explain them, like the checks that were written to the, in the children's names. Oh, they always wonder about those. And any transfer that of $1,000 or more during those five years, a typical mass health worker will challenge and say, that was a transfer for less than fair market value. And as to all of those transfers, they're gonna add up the value of all of those, and they're gonna say, as to all of those transfers, Mary is going to become ineligible for mass health for a certain period of time. And the way they figure that out is they, they're going to take the amount of the transfers, this is more math, they're going to divide by what they consider to be the average cost of nursing home care in Massachusetts right now. I'll pretend that that's $300 a day. It's not. They, even though the real cost around here is about $400 a day, they still assume it's less than $300. But pretend it's $300. What that means in terms of the look-back rule is that if Mary made a gift of $30,000, within the five years, and then goes to qualify for Mass Health because she can show them she has less than $2,000 and therefore no other assets that can be used for the nursing home. They're gonna to say to her, well, that's all well and good, but because of that gift of $30,000, you are disqualified for a period equal to 30,000 divided by 300, or 100 days, a little over three months. Now, during that period, you're on private pay, except you don't have any money to pay on private pay which means you gotta deal with the nursing home trying to throw you up during that period because you're on private pay. This creates some, a lot of agita you know, for a lot of families. So, so that's why you don't wanna be stuck in that look back period. But if you've got a lot of money, the, you know, the flip side of all of that, the flip side of all of that is you could say to yourself, well, if I've got a lot of money, and you know, if I'm Peter, Paul, and Mary, and, and Mom's in the nursing home, if, if I, the day that she goes to the nursing home, if I transfer all of her assets out, to me, the kid, right? And then I just pay the nursing home for five years at the regular private pay rate. On the first day following the fifth anniversary of the transfer, everything else is safe. Everything else is safe. So isn't there a point at which, rather than whereas, if I do all this other stuff, you know, that you, I just described to you, and I reduce her assets and other that are qualifier for mass health, and say she lives more than five years, right? I gotta keep paying. I mean, if the mass health, it, it, the, 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 the assets have to keep pay, keep getting paid. The burn rate is lower, but the but the money can keep diminishing, right? So that's what people talk to me about. And so the question is, how do you figure out the line? How, where, where, how do you cross that line? So I'm gonna give you an example of that, right? So remember, private pay, $12,000 a month, month minus Mary's income is $10,000. It's $10,000 per month is the burn rate. So, if you, were if you were using this strategy and you said, okay, I'm gonna pay privately for five years and everything else is gonna be safe, what would that cost you? Well, there it is, $600,000, right? 60 months divided by $10,000. Now, remember Mary's assets? There's, there's the now, pretend Mary had these in assets. Pretend they grew. She's got a house now worth 500,000. Her IRA went up, the annuity and the bank account stayed the same. So now, same income but she's got assets of $1,125,000, right? So wouldn't it be worth it in that case to just transfer all the money out and then just pay, pay on private pay, right? And then once you pass the five years, everything else is safe. Well, to figure that out, um, and, and, and there it is, right? You, you'd say to yourself, okay, what would be left at the end of those five years? If you had $1,125,000 to start and, and you, know, you paid the $600,000, there'd still be $525,000 left that would be saved after five years. So isn't this a good idea? So when you're thinking about this, the thing that you want to compare is the two different burn rates. Remember, if Mary is on private pay, her burn rate is $10,000 a month, which means at, at the end of five years, she's burned, burned away $600,000, right? She's on mass health, on the other hand. She's only burning at the rate of $5,000 a month, so that at the end of the five years, she's only paid $300,000 out of her money, out of her money. The difference is $300,000, right? So in this example, if Mary lived for five years, 
exactly five years while you were paying on private pay, right? And then die at the end of the five years. There would, there would, the, the difference between doing it that way and having Mary on mass health during those five years, paying at the lower rate, is $300,000, 600 minus 300. That's the difference. So if, if, even if Mary were looking at this and Mary had a ton of money, right? She'd still say to herself, if she was only gonna live five years, well, I'm still gonna go the mass health route because at the end of those five years, instead of having spent $600,000, I've only spent $300,000. And the amount of money left, instead of being 525, is 825. Where did the lines cross? After 10 years. After 10 years. If Mary were on Mass Health for 10 years, then at the end of those 10 years, she would have spent $600,000, which is $5,000 a month, right, for all of those 10 years, right? So, the kind of the, the, the moral of the story, and if, if you're in this kind of situation and you have a lot of assets, Right? And Mary's income is fairly small. Unless you think she's going to live a long time, always makes sense to qualify for mass health. Always makes sense to qualify. In this case, in this example, unless she was going to live for more than 10 years. Right? The only exception to that rule is if Mary has very high income. Right? Because remember, if, if Mary has very, very high income, well then, the burn rate on the money month by month becomes much smaller. Suppose Mary had, because she had a pension, suppose she was a teacher that also worked a ton part-time, right? Maybe she's got incomes, five, six, seven thousand dollars a month, right? In that situation, the, the, the burn rate on her money during those five years is going to be, if it's over seven thousand dollars, is going to be zero. Because remember on Mass Health, right, it, it, there's, there's, there's no payment. The burn rate, if she's making twelve, if she's paying twelve thousand dollars a month, is only going to be five thousand dollars. So in those situations, you want to kind of look at it. the bottom line of all of this. You got to figure it out. You got to do the math, take the individual situation, and figure out. And I'm just going to mention one other thing. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Long-term care insurance. So if you're Mary, Frank is dead, and you're trying to figure out all of these options, right? But one of the things that you're most concerned about is the house, right? Because the house constitutes almost half of your assets. And a lot of times when people come in to talk to me about these kinds of issues, they want to protect things in case they go to a nursing home. Especially that situation, Frank's died, Mary is talking to me. She doesn't want to lose control over her cash, but she is comfortable transferring out an interest in the house to her kids, keeping a life estate, and therefore trying to protect the house. But even if she does that, she is really losing something. The alternative is, um, you just need to be aware of this. If Mary has a long-term care insurance policy that will pay at least $200 a day to the nursing home, or at least, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me go to the next one. Go back to here, remember this, right? Private pay minus, minus the income. If you have long-term care insurance, then the long-term care insurance actually gets added I'm getting tired. <laughs> now I remember why I have these slides. In general, I don't recommend long-term care insurance. I don't recommend it. The reason is, in Mary's case, the policy that you would need in order to cover all of the long-term care costs, in order to, to not have to private pay, is gigantic. Because you'd have to have a policy that was going to be paying $10,000 a month for like five years. The cost of that policy is astronomical. Remember those are Mary's assets, remember the house. Um, there. If Mary had an old long-term care insurance policy, older than March 15, 1999, and that policy paid $50 a day or more for two years, and if Mary goes from her house to a nursing home, MassHealth can't lean the house. The house is not a countable asset, now South can't lean the house, and there's no claim against the house after she dies. But you say to yourself, that was a long time ago. And by the way, I, I, I have cases that come in now, but there are, these policies are still there. People are wondering why they're still paying, right? Why they're still paying on them. But I'll give you an example to go with this case, right? I had a lady that came in with her husband. Uh, she, she was kind of managing things, although it was her husband's mother that was in the nursing home. 
They had spent down all of the assets. She was about to move to the nursing home. They had spent, she tried to stay at home, but she couldn't afford it. She was going to the nursing home. The only asset is the condo. The condo is worth $250,000. It's a nice one. And she said, so I know how this works, right? Mom's gonna get, my mother-in-law is going to go to the nursing home. There's going to be a lien on the condo. And after her death, they're going to recover. And I said, do you have any long-term care insurance policy? She said, yeah, but it's just this one junk policy. It's not going to cover anything. It's only worth fifty. No, it was $60 a day. It was worth $50, $60 a day. I said, how old was it? And she said, oh, it's really old. I don't know how old. Well, I said, how old? And she, she pulled it out. She had it. And it was dated in 1998. She bought it in 1998. And it paid $60 a day for two years. It was this minimal policy. I said, let me make you a day. Condo is safe. Condo is safe. You can qualify your mother. They can't count the condo. They can't lien the, the condo. And there's no claim against the condo after you die. Right? Suppose the policy is after that date. In that case, you still only need a very small policy, that policy policy that will pay $125 per day, it can be an elimination period, a period during which they don't even pay, of one year, and it has to pay for two years, about 730 days, which is two, two years. And there has to be at least one day left on the policy. So even if you had this little policy, and say it had a home care option to it, that you could use the money to pay home care, and you used it. Say mom was at home, you were trying to keep mine at home, and you know, but, the, but you wanted to supplement, you needed the money for home care, you used it. As long as you kept at least one, and typically these policies they'll pay by the day, and they'll say for each day, we'll either pay the nursing home or we'll pay home care. As long as you have one day left on the policy, when you go to the nursing home, the house is safe. No matter what the house is worth, it can be a million dollar house. I tell people down, because I do a lot of work on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. In Nantucket, everybody's house is a million dollar house, right? Everybody should have this policy. It costs them peanuts, right? And they guarantee that that house will never be exposed. It's like a, that's like a big deal for these kinds of situations. Um, we talked about that. That's it. There's a lot of stuff that I covered. If you want to hear it again, and I, I tend to talk too fast on this one because I'm trying to get a lot in. If you want to hear it again, as you know, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. Tell the law, Frank and Mary, and you can see it anytime. And the goal of the exercise always is to sleep well at night. So I hope that this has helped you in terms of at least letting you know that even if you or your, one of your relatives has done no planning, no planning, and needs nursing home care, even if they're single, at least there is a way to, you know, to reduce, to, to get you off of private pay and perhaps really increase the chance that there'll be something left after that person Any questions? Yes, sir. Author, I have two questions. Yeah. The first one, when you spoke about the 4D D4C. D4C. Yeah. You said there's a 20% on the balance. Does the same apply if they have a family of four and they have three children? Yeah. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Or is it different? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So say you make the room lavish. I mean, you buy everything. Yeah. The person does. Who owns all that stuff? So t t the question is, you put all this great stuff in the room and the person dies. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that stuff's going to have to go to that person's estate. All right. right. Doesn't belong to the nursing home. Oh no, 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 no! It's going to go to that person's estate. Oh. Right. And, and and by the way, assuming that you did this right, so that there were like extra assets at the end, <coughs> that means that they can go to the family, right? Because Mass Health is Mass Health has a lien on the estate, but the, but Mass Health <coughs> isn't going to be owed anything in these cases, right? Okay. Okay. Are there any questions? If not, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the year. We'll see you next year.